we begin our journey in learning to interpret NMR spectra with groups and integrations. I think it is one of the most fundamental skills uh, that students need to learn to do this type of stuff successfully. And also it's a pretty basic thing. It, it's, it's not like trying to learn how to interpret the coupling patterns, which we are going to do. Oh, we're going to do. But that, you know, it's, it takes a little more uh, effort to get really comfortable with those. We're going to work our way up. Uh, to that level of interpretation. Begin with groups and integrations. And we've been talking about so far, uh, you know, looking at a structure and deciding here's how many groups of protons and their integrations that a structure should have, whether the structure is symmetric or not, how many groups of carbons it should have, that type of thing. And it works pretty well, and you get a lot of information that way. The problem with it, of course, is, as with almost everything else we encounter, there is the ideal world where everything is perfect, and then there is the real world where sometimes things aren't quite as perfect as we would like. And NMR spectra are certainly no exception to that. As we talk about some of this stuff, it's not a bad idea to have uh, an actual copy of the spectra that I'm going to be showing uh, here on the screen either print it out or on your own computer or on paper. Uh, for students in the class, there's a link in the uh, course website. Uh, I also put a link in the uh, video description uh, that's been posted on YouTube. Uh, so, you know, anybody can get a, get a hold of that and see, you know, see the actual spectra that I'll be talking about simply because having them on your own computer or on paper can be a little bit, you know, higher resolution and easier to see things than simply uh, the pictures that are going to show up uh, over here. One of the biggest issues that we see in learning to interpret NMR spectra is the problem of signal overlap. The idea that this molecule should have four different proton groups, say, but we're going to see fewer than that because some of the signals where they should you know, ideally be different from each other are going to be just overlapped, okay? And we are going to see essentially only one signal where, where we should see, if the world were perfect, two, okay? And so I want to show you a couple of examples of this and the kinds of molecules where this is fairly common, uh, fairly commonly seen. Uh, one of them is simply this, uh, chlorohexane, okay? We've got chlorine here at the end of a long string of carbons, a uh, long alkyl chain. Now, if we look at that structure, we would say, ah, there are six groups of protons in here, okay? The molecule is not symmetric, so all the groups of protons are distinct. And they would come in a 3 to 2 to 2 to 2 to 2 to 2 ratio, okay? Uh, and then when we take a look at the actual proton spectrum for this molecule, we see something a little bit different. Now, what we see here is uh, actually four uh, resonances, not the uh, expected number of six. And their integrations are three to six to two to two. Now, this is a lovely example of overlap, that some of the signals that, that are distinct are, are just also very, very close together and are overlapping each other. Okay. And so three of these CH2 groups have almost certainly just simply merged with each other and given us one large signal, the one that integrates all the way to six, uh, instead of the uh, three separate signals integrating to two each. To be honest with you, CH2 groups in a long alkyl chain like this one, or in a cyclic molecule, a cyclohexane derivative, say, which is very common in natural products, that is where you will see a lot of overlap in proton spectra. Okay? It just, it, those, those signals are just not different enough uh, that they are often, you know, not seen separately, but seen kind of clumped up uh, together. It's something that we just have to deal with. Signals that, over, that integrate larger than we would expect are often signs of overlap. Now, there are a couple of ways that you can uh, mitigate overlap or at least address it a little bit in the way you just simply present the spectrum. For example, the spectrum that I've been showing here is the way that a lot of uh, textbooks or other, others, other sources may present it. This is what I call the full spectrum. 
to be honest with you, I've never quite liked uh, the way sometimes some of these textbooks and other sources will present them because, to be honest, there's a lot of dead space in that spectrum. At the beginning and at the end, there's just a lot of this area that is just no information in it. And so why bother presenting it? Okay? Uh, I tend to prefer zooming in on the spectra uh, and leaving, you know, cutting off any dead space at the ends. This is the way I would present it. It still looks like four, you know, four resonances, although you can see the fine structure in them now. There is some lovely coupling patterns in there. And in fact, I just want to look at them for just a moment. Mm. My God, they're beautiful. And we will learn to interpret them in a little while. Okay. But even here, when you're zoomed in, you don't see, you know, all six signals. You just see that this one in here uh, is pretty complicated looking, and that's the certainly, certainly the one that's overlapped. Carbon spectra, which if you are taking proton spectra and not taking carbon, that's a mistake as far as I'm concerned. Because carbon spectra are so useful in so many different ways. And one of the things that I like about carbon spectra is they are less prone to overlap. Okay, so this molecule uh, of chlorohexane did not give us, you know, the real spectrum didn't give us what the ideal uh, number of signals in the proton would be. But here in the carbon spectrum, we see all six carbons, uh, very nice, very distinct. Okay. And so carbon spectra are, you know, are less prone to overlap. Not completely immune to it. It's an issue here as well. But for reasons we'll talk about later, carbon spectra are less prone to signal overlap than proton spectra are. Another group of molecules where overlap is very commonly seen are the aromatic molecules. Now we're not studying chemical shifts in great detail yet, but as you do a few of these types of spectra, students really quickly pick up that the area around 7 ppm in a proton spectrum, 120 to 150 in a carbon spectrum, is definitely characteristic of an aromatic molecule, something with a benzene ring in it. Uh, and this is another area where overlap in proton and sometimes even in carbon is not unheard of. For example, take a simple aromatic molecule, simply toluene here. If we look at the structure, we would, uh, in the ideal world, look at that and say, oh look, there are one, two, three, four groups, and they should integrate three to two to two to one in the proton spectrum. When we look at the proton spectrum, once again, here's what we see looking at the full spectrum, and it, you know, depending upon the resolution of the screen and what you're looking at and what you have on paper, you know, it might or might not be clear that there are actually four uh, four separate signals in here. They look like there's, it looks like, you know, on this full spectrum here, there may be only be two. And in fact, as presented here, they are integrating three to five. Now, five, an integration of five in the aromatic region, that is almost certainly a giveaway that you have a singly substituted aromatic ring. Okay, that is a, that's a very common uh, type of structure here. Zooming in, now we start to see that there really are uh, three aromatic signals, the ortho, the meta, the para. Uh, sometimes you could see that, but even when they are, uh, even when they're really close together like that, it's difficult to get the integrations to be perfectly two to two to one often. So sometimes even on a zoom spectrum like this, you will see it, you know, integrated simply as a group of five. Okay? Five aromatic protons, singly substituted ring. Okay? In the carbon spectrum, now, again, this one really is dependent upon how the spectrum is presented. Here, the full spectrum, uh, it may not be entirely clear that there is one, two, three, four, five separate carbons in here, because two of them are actually pretty darn close together. Okay? So at first glance, it may look like there's four, not five. Very oftentimes, if a, a carbon spectrum is presented and this is an issue, uh, sometimes you will see it zoomed in, uh, something like this. This is the way, this is the kind of the way I would like to look at it. Some uh, sources will actually give what's called an insert or a kind of a spectrum, ex a spectral expansion right there in the full spectrum. It will look something like this, where they've taken a small slice and then zoomed just that region out somewhere, you know, on the overall presentation. That's a reasonable way to do it, to try to emphasize that 
what look like maybe one carbon signal is actually two. They're just pretty close together. And if you're far away, they may look like they're overlapped, or they may look overlapped, but as you zoom in, you can see that there really are clearly two distinct peaks there. Another way that I've seen uh, sources uh, get around this issue if they insist on presenting the full spectrum, even all the dead space out there, is they will present it as a labeled spectrum, or they will label the chemical shifts of each of the peaks, and sometimes you will look at it and say, oh look, that kind of looks like one peak, but there are two labels on it. That is a way that some sources will tell you, oh, be careful, there's probably two peaks there. In an, again, in an ideal world, uh, this isn't as much of an issue if this is a spectrum you yourself took, if you actually have the raw data and are processing this thing. Uh, for my students, I tell them, uh, tell them frequently, it's always a good idea if you actually have the raw data and it's sitting there on your computer, zoom in on the carbons just to make absolutely sure that, that each distinct carbon is not really uh, two signals that are just really close together. When you actually have the raw data and you sit there on a computer and with the mouse and just do a lot of uh, close-up looks like that, that makes it really easy to do. In this situation where we our spectra are presented either electronically or printed out on paper and you don't have access to the raw data and the specialized software for manipulating it, well we have to you know make do as best we can. I tend to prefer, in my own work, uh, zoomed-in spectra, where I leave the uh, flat space off. If I want to emphasize to students that there are no other signals, that I haven't cheated you by cutting off something, I usually will say no other signals present, upfield or downfield, on either side of the spectrum. So remember, we don't live in an ideal world. We live in the real world. Very often, groups and integrations, it's a it's a, an enormously powerful source of information, and it's our first step in learning how to interpret NMR spectra. But do be on the lookout. Signal overlap in uh, molecules with lots of CH2 groups in them, uh, aromatic molecules. Signal overlap is an issue uh, that pops up from time to time, and we just simply learn to deal with it. So keep that in mind, and talk to you later.